Hey guys. Is it? Okay. Uh, this is chapter five, Coral Reefs and Lagoons. It's big enough, okay. All right, um, your vocab words. Coral bleaching, ahermatypic, hermatypic, zooxanthellae, or you can say zooxanthellae, that's also fine. Um, geomorphology, fringing reef, atoll. I think there's one down here too. I can't move that. Um, atoll, patch reef, reef erosion, ocean acidification, anchorage, artificial reef, radiocarbon dating, and subsidence. What is, what is, is there a word that's missing there? There is, sorry. Can't see it. Coral! My favorite. Sad day for coral. Okay, coral reef. Um, they're going to cover over 284,000 kilometers. Um, the next slide I have what that can compare to, especially if it's the Great Barrier Reef. Um, it's one of the most biodiverse places on the planet. Biodiversity is really important because there's so many different species and like micro species um, and other plant species that could really help us with medicine. Um, that's where we derive all of our medicines from. Um, we just find a plant that makes a really good chemical and just reproduce it, reproduce it, reproduce it. That's what we do. Um, but, you know, they're really, they're helpful economically and they're helpful for um, for our, our health. Okay. Um, all the organisms there are really reliant on the coral themselves that are first level consumers, filter feeders, and then they have their zooxanthellae, which are their main producers for them. Okay. Um, climate change or pollution, runoff, uh, actual reef erosion, all of those are happening at an increasing rate. Um, I read an interesting article. Um, I don't, we won't be able to see this tab, but it says, um, let's see, it says, revising Darwin's sinking island theory. New study helps resolve a dispute over the origins of coral reef formations. This was um, put on physics or phys.org under their earth sciences, May 13, 2013, um, by I believe either a professor or a student studying at the um, MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And pretty much they were saying, um, essentially, we need to really be considering sea level. Um, sorry, it was just on that tab. But, you know, we have that general you form a fringing reef, and then it's going to be a barrier reef as your um, island starts to sink. And then it's going to turn into your atoll once your island has totally subsided. Um, but at the rate we're having sea level rise, that same trend isn't showing anymore. Um, you know, where scientists would have then, okay, well, if we have that theory and it's working, then we should be able, like Hawaii is an example. We should be able to go to Hawaii in, you know, in uncertain of their, um, you know, island chains. We should be able to see them in this formation and instead where they imagine they should be seeing um, a barrier reef and then even an atoll they have a reef that's underwater and it's or i'm sorry an island that's underwater and essentially the the reef like can't build itself um vertically to get sunlight at the rate that sea level is increasing if that makes sense so, you know, before they had really good adaptations for the environment they were living in, um, as they start to sink, you know, further down, um, you know, they would climb back up. But now not only are they sinking further down, we're also increasing the water column whenever we have any of our ice sheets melting, any of that thing like that. So anyhow, I thought that was interesting. But um, over 90% of the corals in the Great Barrier Reef are suffering from coral bleaching, which is really just the expulsion or the loss of the symbiotic um, zooxanthellae that's living inside of them. Otherwise, corals would be like the color of our bone. They don't need to have color at all. Okay, just a little bit of examples here, a little bit of stats. Um, how many different islands do you have? How many different types of fish? Sharks and rays, um, how many different types of hard and soft corals, 
and really impressive size comparisons. I feel like when we see Australia, it doesn't seem that big to us, but it is really big. Actually, has um, a lot of different kind of climates on there. And and then over here we have your reef area. Anyway, 70 million football fields. That's nuts. So corals are going to live in the phylum um, or belong in the phylum Cnidaria. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to go through the domain, kingdom, phylum, order, family. Oh, I missed it. I missed it. I missed it. Hold on. I'm going to get it right. Let me pause this. Got it. Um, domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So <laughs> they're in the domain eukarya, which means that they have nuclei inside of their cells. Um, the kingdom is animalia, which means that they have to eat something else to get energy. They're not a producer or a decomposer. And then their phylum is cnidarians. And then there's different classes like cubozoa, cyphozoa, anthozoa, hydrozoas. Um, those are your different classes. And then under that, we have multiple different kinds of orders. And then it goes family, genus, species. Um, but cnidarians are cool. Um, I don't know why it's spelled C-N. It's definitely not an English word. It's got to be um, Latin. But cnidocytes, nido, spelled C-N-I-D-O-C-Y-T-E, are cells that have um, like stinging cells in them. So corals are going to belong to that group because they can like within their little polyps have little stinging cells and that's going to be one way that they can take in some nutrients. They're called cnidarians. Put yourself along. Okay, cute. Coral physiology. If you guys click this link, you can see a little bit more video about the coral physiology. Um, but they spend most of their adult life as polyps, as do anemones. A polyp is just like one coral. And then they like grow on top of, or not grow on top of each other, but grow in conjunction with each other. And they're all identical, right? They reproduce um, through asexual reproduction. Um, let me turn my chair. Um, yeah, so asexual reproduction. So they really just make an identical copy of themselves called budding. They just make a copy of themselves. And it's going to have the exact same genetic information. So they're going to look exactly the same. And be exactly the same. So if they are a coral that's living in, um, temperature change that that's you know great temperature changes or um, pH changes then that's good because they're only going to start making more of those same type of corals that are really resilient. Anyways, um, polyps are sessile, which means that they don't move or sessile, whatever you want to say. Um, they don't move whenever they're in their adult life stage. Um, they're very simple. They have um, epidermal tissue, so an outside tissue, and they're like a cylinder shape. Um, they have tentacles that are surrounding their mouth. So their mouth is going to be like this hole inside the middle of them. And all around them are tentacles. Um, and inside we have inside each cell is a little, like inside each nematocyst is, an, um, is like a stinging cell. The mouth is going to move down to their stomach. Um, they are not... I don't know. You know, they're not obviously not as complex as us, so they're not going to need so many different, you know, long and uh, long and small intestine or um, anything like that. They're really simple. They really just need their gastric acid to break down um, any of the proteins that they're eating or any of the, the material that they're eating and then send it to the rest of their cells. They're really simple. And again, their stomach will have digestive enzymes. Closed captions. I feel like it wouldn't get it right. I feel like it couldn't keep up. It says Google wants to use your microphone. Whatever. Okay. Coral lifestyle. Um, so they can live as one or they can grow in a huge colony. So we have the, the hermits, the hermitific corals. They stay in one place and they build reefs. They are all identical to each other, or they're identical to their species. <gasps> um, a hermitific, if we have A in front of something, that means not. So these ones are not reef builders. What? Yeah. Okay, so they're not reef builders. So here's like a sweet little sea fan. Cute. Look at that. 
And all of these little, you know, like um, tentacles coming out, their job is to do a couple things. Their job is to extract nutrients. Their job is to also, like, take out oxygen in the water. You know, doing, opening up your hands or opening up your little tentacles like this, you are opening up the surface area so all parts of them can extract oxygen um, versus if you did this. If I do this, just the outsides can do it. But if I do this, all parts now can do it. Like that's um, staghorn coral. Cute. Okay, this is an ahermatypic coral. Same thing. Inside of their little tentacles is their mouth, and that's what could get full of sediment whenever the water is very turbid. Beautiful. Lots of plate corals. Plate corals form like the, the plates, literally, like the, the edges. You know, if you think you could eat off one of these, that's the plate coral. Plate coral is also a hermitivic coral and reproduces through asexual reproduction. And then we have some stag horns right there. This one's fun too. I don't know the name of this one. But why, you know, why do they move around like this? All of them are tiny little tentacles. Same thing. They're just trying to extract nutrients and extract oxygen. If they move the water themselves, they are like oxygenating the water. The water doesn't stay like stagnant. This one's cool. Um, I'm trying to think the name of this. Eh, whatever. All right, I can't think of the name of this. Um, but what this organism does is it releases a mucus or secretes a mucus onto itself. And then um, what you see here is, you know, reds and, and little whites. And obviously this is very much sped up. It's like marine snow and just particulate matter that's settling down in the bottom and it gets stuck on that mucus and <laughs> sucks it back in. Like, how smart. Kind of same thing of um, you, you know, put out a couple of fishing lines and then go mow the lawn or something or go to work and then you come back and you have fish on your, on your line. I don't want the pointer on. I said at 1230. Water cracker. Okay. Um, again, all of these these are all sweet little a hermatypic corals, and um, same thing. Opening up their surface areas, opening up their little tentacles. And here's their little mouth, their little filter feeders, little mouth, little mouth, little mouth. And um, not only are the tentacles good for uh, you know taking in food, they're also really good for fighting off predators. Like a hermatypics are soft corals. They're flexible. They do not have coral skeletons. Um, they do look a lot like plants or trees or fans. They do not have the symbiotic relationship with zooxanthellae. Examples of these are sea whips, sea fans, gorgonians. Here's your sea whip, sea fan, gorgonian. Okay, they do not have a symbiotic relationship with zooxanthellae. So, um, there, you know, we immediately think there has to be a lot less of these species than there are of your hermitivic corals because they don't have that extra, like, oof, you can survive, you can build yourself really big. They don't, have, they're, you know, they're not getting all that organic material. Hermitivic corals, um, they are reef building corals. They live in colonies, and they always have zooxanthellae inside of them. Um, colonies begin when the tiny little planktonic coral larvae. And since coral is not a producer, coral is your first level consumer, so it's essentially an animal. When they are in a planktonic form, they are also a part of the, zo um, the zooplankton like trophic level. Okay. When they land on a hard substrate, they can start to attach and grow into a polyp. Um, if it survives, it can reproduce asexually in a process called budding. Um, it, and again, it's a direct copy of itself. The corals can cement themselves to the substrate or to like your volcanic rock, and um, they make calcium carbonate, like 
just that really, really hard skeleton, and that's going to adhere them to the, um, to the rock. If the corals can die, no big deal. Another one can grow back on it. Um, they're just going to add another layer of calcium carbonate, and then eventually this is what limestone will get turned into, um, and it can have many different shapes, and it's pretty much just like corals constantly like building on each other over and over again. Sad day. Sitting in the bottom of my laptop. This is a review from chapter two. I'll move this around. Um, the mutualistic relationship with uh, the zooxanthellae and its symbiont, the coral. Um, again, they wouldn't be able to make large reefs or, or build as much of themselves without the help of the zooxanthellae, giving them extra nutrients. Corals cannot feed as much as they need to feed um, to keep themselves growing at the size that they normally grow. To sustain their coral reef, um, they just wouldn't be able to do it. There's not enough nutrients for them to extract. Um, so, zooxanthellae are going to create the glucose, C6HLO6, through photosynthesis, and they're going to share it with the corals. And in the meantime, the corals will give the zooxanthellae a lovely source of carbon dioxide, so it can do photosynthesis, and it will also give it a home and protection. Okay, and um, again, this asterisk here, corals don't have to eat because you're getting a lot of nutrients in the zooxanthellae, but they can use their tentacles to capture their own food with like those little nidocytes, their singing cells. Corals eat zooplankton, like your crown of thorns starfish larvae. Um, so here's the outside of a staghorn coral. And in this one, we see the tissues, we'll assume. It is full screen mode. Okay. And then you, inside this one, I'm going to stop moving the cursor so you can see the zooxanthellae there. We also have zooxanthellae here. And this is from a, um, a light microscope? Or is it a, a transmission? I think it's a transmission electron microscope. Anyway, um, you can see your zooxanthellae inside of there. And then on the outside, we have our tiny little stinging cells. Yep. And if we look, so this is kind of how it's all wrapped up. So at the tip of your tentacles, your tip of your tentacles, we have this tightly coiled, um, you know, cell. It's called an amatocyst. Inside of there, we have this coiled, like, trigger, this coiled needle. And when an organism, you know, disrupts any of these tentacles, the trigger the needle will actually come out of the nematocyst and sting the um the predator or sting the threat and uh if it's venomous or not you know really depends on what that can do I look like i'm 12 years old physical factors for coral growth um between 30 degrees north 30 degrees south and we did that for bell work um most important factors temperature they have to grow in temps ranging between 16 to 35 degrees Fahrenheit, but that is not their favorite. Their favorite is between, um, uh, sorry, 23 to 25 degrees, and I didn't mean to say Fahrenheit, um, 23 to 25 degrees Celsius. So they can range between 16 and 35 degrees Celsius, but their favorite is 23 to 25, so right in the middle. Too low, their enzymes are going to go too slow. Too high, their enzymes can start to denature. Corals at the end of the range will grow slower. Okay, and again, their favorite temperature is between 23 and 25. Florida and Japan are able to grow corals because we have really warm currents moving up our continental shelf. Um, specifically right here, and I'm on the left, the right side of this map. Okay, Florida has this pink area here, but that's because we have the Gulf Stream blowing across from Africa. Um, the Gulf Stream also really warms the water there, which is why we get so many hurricanes. Okay, um, depth. We did this a lot for bell work today. Um, corals are going to go fastest whenever they're within 20 meters of the surface because as depth increases, light intensity decreases, and we need light intensity to be great so we can do photosynthesis. Um, so xanthelli have to have sufficient amount of light. When the water is not turbid, that is also helpful. 
Um, so coral reefs will really not grow in an area that's by runoff because that will definitely increase turbidity. If we have more sediment in the water or it's more cloudy, it's more turbid, um, it's going to decrease sunlight penetration and then therefore decrease photosynthesis. Um, a hermatypic corals, your non-reef building corals that do not have zooxanthellae can be found deeper and in um, not temperatures that are super zooxanthellae bougie, if you will. Um, but, and really that's because they don't rely on zooxanthellae. Um, they just do their own thing and they're able to filter feed. Algal blooms can cause blockage of light of the corals. Um, and again, corals are gonna need sunlight to do photosynthesis in the zooxanthellae, so algal blooms can also negatively affect it. But algal blooms are gonna occur really where we're gonna have a high amount of runoff and corals are already known to kind of back away from that. Um, their salinity, their substrate and their pH. Um, don't, again, don't shy away from these details. We have to know what corals need to grow. Um, so corals are gonna need a rocky substrate. They can't attach to sand, um, it has to be really dense. And this is awesome because normally things cannot grow on volcanic material for millions of years. And, you know, one of our most beautiful organisms is able to do it right away. Um, they are not adapted for fresh water or for even brackish water for your, your mix. Um, so we're not going to have any kind of corals in the river or anything like that. Um, they do not grow well near river, ma river mouths, again, because it's going to increase runoff and it's also going to bring really diluted fresh water. They can't do that. Um, and uh, I was gonna talk. doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what I was going to say. Um, pH needs to be slightly basic, 8.1 to 8.5, or um, another word for saying basic is saying alkaline. If the pH drops, is it going to cause stress on your corals? Um, because the like carbonate ions are going to get leached from it, causing it to be like really weakened, really weakened. Think like it's kind of like having brittle bones. You're really susceptible to getting broken um, and, and being more a threat to your predators, like the crown of thorns starfish. But that's just for the Indo Pacific regions. Um, and, you know, um, excuse me, physical factors like storms. All right. Again, high amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere um, have decreased the ocean pH. It creates carbonic acid. Here we are burning fossil fuels. This is what we do. Um, we have carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It gets dissolved into the ocean. It can also diffuse out. Those typically stay at equilibrium. The amount coming in is really going to be taken in for photosynthesis, and the amount coming out is going to be um, respirated out from cellular respiration. And again, this is just a repeat from last chapter. Oh, sorry, I'm yawning. Um, again, we're putting in every year two gigatons of carbon from the burning of fossil fuels, and that has to go somewhere. Um, since the 18th century, we've decreased the pH of seawater by 30%. This will cause any kind of shelled organism to start to lose its shells um, and just make them more susceptible to predation and to erosion and weathering. Okay, um, so pH, um, what substrate they're growing on has to be a hard substrate, a rough substrate. Um, salinity needs to be salty. Um, the temperature, it has to be warm. And depth requirements are met, being within 20 meters of the, of the surface. And again, your pH needs to be alkaline. Then the coral begin to make a calcium, <laughs> calcium um, carbonate skeleton. So like when the star is aligned, perfect. And, you know, it's so, it's just, something really to marvel at that there's such particulars having to happen, you know, other organisms can really withdo uh, and withstand a lot of stress like that. Humans as well. And, you know, corals have to have their, their physical conditions perfect, which they are literally at the mercy of the environment. They really, they cannot change their conditions, you know, like, like we can. You know, our body has mechanisms to help us whenever we're cold. We can also put a jacket on. They cannot do that. They can't cool themselves down if they get too hot. They can't warm themselves up if they get too cold. But yet, here we are growing these beautiful, 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 um, you know, ecosystems, and they're super picky. Anyways, when the seabed starts to sink or starts to subside, it's going to obviously move further away from your surface, which is going to decrease light penetration. So they're going to grow vertically. Um, they're going to grow vertically so they can stay near where the sunlight is and um, do photosynthesis.
And so you have a fun little photo here. And you can see all the corals continually growing on top of themselves. And this is where he said in class day, you could take a, a you know, a drill, a core, and like drill it all the way down through this coral. Down, 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 down. And what you should find is the calcium carbonate at the bottom is way older than the calcium carbonate at the top. How can we do this? Well, it has carbon in it, and we can do radioactive carbon dating. I don't know why I sang that. You're welcome. You guys never appreciate my song. Come on, computer. There we are. There we are. Different kinds of reefs. Um, geomorpho geomorphology is exactly like the root words it's made of. Geo is going to be like geology and land. Morph is how something is created. And algae is the study of. So it's the study of how landforms have been developed. Um, so here was Darwin's observation while he was on the HMS Beagle. It was also whenever he was traveling to the Galapagos and saw the finches and saw the adaptations of their beaks to eat different sizes of seeds and allow them to diversify. It allowed them to have more niches and allowed them to have, um, you know, more feeding opportunities and more um, habitat opportunities. So, anyways, while he was on that boat, he also came across many islands, and, you know, when you have an, an island arc or, like, an island chain, they might be a couple miles away from each other in the ocean, but they're all kind of next to each other, kind of like Hawaii. So, he was able to see this different progression of steps. So, he proposed that corals will start um, as a fringing reef. Excuse me. Um, gosh, he made a lot of books, like on the origin of species, um, that was his evolution book, uh, coral reefs, he's got more, also really, really uniquely named. All right, so he said your first reef is going to be a fringing reef. Um, this is going to be a reef that is very close to the land it is associated with, and there's almost um, little to no lagoons. A barrier reef will form the next because the island is going to start to be really heavy and dense, denser than the oceanic bottom below it. It's going to start to sink. And as it starts to sink, right, here's our island. It's pretty wide. Um, it's going to start to sink. The widest part's going underneath the water. And what's going to stay up is just this part, like the tiny parts, the, the more narrow tip of the island. So, um, you know, it's not as wide anymore. And water's going to come in and fill it, creating that lagoon. Um, and then as the island completely sinks, and this could take 30 million years or so, now you have um, a very central, like a circular-shaped reef with a central lagoon. And all the way at the bottom is going to be, um, it's going to be your, I don't want to say volcano, but your um, island. Question. I was kind of looking this up, and I don't know. I can't really change that camera. Let me draw it out. Maybe I know the answer and I'm just like overthinking it. I don't know. Okay, hold on one second. I feel like I'm doing this wrong. It has to be land here too. But they keep growing in themselves. Okay, okay, okay. Here's my question. All right, here's my former island, right? And it was up here, above the water, beautiful day, and then it sinks. What happens? Like, where does it go? Where does it go now? Like, here's going to be our oceanic crust, and then down here is the mantle of the earth. Where does it go? Because honestly, like, does it is it going to get reabsorbed back in the earth? Well, if that's the case, then there needs to be, like, a break in the tectonic crust here. How else is it going to get to the bottom? Secondly, this whole thing was actually built up from a volcano and then started to sink back down. So when it sinks, I know it's going into the water, but where is the rest of it going? I don't know. It's like the ocean floor just opening up. 
I don't know. Maybe I maybe I'm just thinking of it stupidly, and I already know. I just don't. Whatever. If you if you can enlighten me, please do. Um, and then our patch reef is our just um, it could be it's they're located within an atoll, and they're just little small isolated reefs that are in in the lagoon. Okay, here are different reef types again. So we start as a fringing reef. And again, it's easy to tell that it's a fringing reef um, because right when you walk out, when you wake up in the morning, you're going to go out to the beach and immediately you're going to walk onto coral. It's, you know, it's going to have to be underwater because they are saltwater, but it's going to be, you're going to walk pretty much right out to it. Um, there are no lagoons in between the reef and the island. It literally goes... Ocean, reef, island. Nothing in between. Now in this middle picture here, we can see like there is starting to be a small, small, very shallow lagoon starting to form because this island is slowly sinking. And it might only be like three millimeters a year, like something so small. Okay, um, and then... They're really vulnerable in fringing reefs because they're so close to shore. And that's, you know, where we're going to, a lot of our pollutants and runoff are going to come from. Um, turbidity will be high, especially if you're close to shore and there's a lot of runoff. Um, even human disturbances, humans going out, you know, going in their boat or walking on it, breaking it. Um, all of those can disturb them. The barrier reef. So... It's just fantastic. Okay, so it's similar to the fringing reef because it's, it's near the shoreline um, of its larger landmass, of its island that it's located with, but there is now a barrier between the land, the island, and the reef that's around it, and that barrier is a lagoon. So there is a barrier between the landmass and then the, the um, corals that are around it, and that barrier is the lagoon. Um, they're separated by a barrier from the land. Like I said, um, this barrier is deep and wide lagoon. The reef should be, um, up to 97 kilometers from the shore. Could be up to. Lagoons are shallow. Um, they're sheltered body of water and they have a soft sediment bottom. And that's why we don't have corals growing in the lagoon because it's all sand. Um, fringing reefs can also exist in that lagoon that's between the barrier reef and the shoreline. Um, barrier reefs can build up on themselves, making the water dangerous and shallow for boats to travel over them. Um, that is very dangerous. You know, many times they are, you know, coming to an island and then you can't. Um, a lot of our cruise lines can cause a lot of damage this way by not realizing um, how deep a port was and just, you know, running through it. This happens, honestly, I don't know how often, but it happens. It happens. Um, if you guys have ever been on a cruise, whenever you are seeing yourself, like what, if you ever look out of the water, whenever you're leaving port, you can see all the sediment that gets kicked up. That's not good for anything. And so, I mean, you know, that there are no plants living in that part of the water. There just can't be, there can't be, you have way too much sediment moving. You have way too much water moving and whatever else is coming off of that ship. Okay. So here, again, at the bottom, we have our island, and then this white area is the reef really close to it. It's your fringing reef. And we move to our barrier reef. There's a lagoon barrier in between the land and the island. And then that island continues to sink and sink and sink because it's pretty heavy. And then we form to an atoll. Okay, so here's a picture that of, like, what I'm talking about. But I just, where does it go? Where does this go? Like, is it spreading out towards the left and then towards the right? Is this essentially like slipping down into a hole, like into the earth? I don't understand. You know, your reefs will continue to build and build and build and build and build and build because, um, you know, their their corals growing on top of each other. They're going to keep themselves as high as they can. I don't know, y'all. Educate me on that question. Where does it go? Patch reefs. 
They can be found in between um, fringing reefs, and they can be found in barrier reefs. <laughs> they can also be found in atolls. Um, they will also grow vertically within the lagoon, growing higher up for the same reason. They need sunlight, just like everything else does. There we are, patch reefs. Atolls. Do you see, like, in this huge blue falling island? Where is it going? Where is the bottom of it going? I don't know. All right, atolls um, are going to be a ring of coral around a central, very deep lagoon. They could be pretty wide in diameter. They're found in your Indian Ocean and in the Pacific Ocean. Not on our side. Not, like, not by California. Um, I'm trying to think. I think it's called Marshall Island. I think that's one of them. Um, they could be kilometers away from any visible land and the waters are incredibly deep i love this the fringing reef then we're starting to build a barrier reef definitely a barrier reef and now it's just totally gone 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 gone, gone. volcano volcano dies now we can have corals starting to come there. Corals cannot come there if there's a volcano. You gotta think about all that ash is gonna start covering the sunlight. Um, the air is really bad. The air can have a lot of carbon monoxide and you can pass out and die, a lot of sulfur. Things are gonna grow until the volcano dies off. Fringing reef, our reef is right next to the landmass. Barrier reef, we're starting to sink and that's what's causing the, the lagoon to start to form. We have our sinking landmass, and then the lagoon is a barrier between the reefs. And then step four, we have an atoll where there's nothing in the middle at all. And this whole time, and if we look at this one at the bottom, if we're following the like, excuse me, the like cream color right here, going from one to two to three to four in those pictures. You, okay, okay, hold on, this is making a little bit of sense, but I don't know. Um, your reef is, your coral is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. They're going to keep growing. They don't have to grow because the island, or they don't die because the island starts to sink. Because the island starts to sink, they're like, oh, man, we have to go higher. And they grow and grow and grow and grow. I don't want this here. Okay, so like in this bottom picture, it has number four. I mean, I guess the corals would have to go really fast to start growing, um, like, over the atoll, like this area right here. They would have to start growing really fast when it starts to sink. And I can't imagine why they couldn't. I'm sure they could. Okay, but again, where it says atoll at the bottom, where does it go? In, in my opinion, then, it can't be, could it really be as deep as they say it is? Because you're going to be hitting, like, you know, you're, you're diving, 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 and then you hit the top of the volcano. Well, it's going to start to erode off, but I don't know. Where does it go? Back into the earth? Okay, so again, we need to know these steps. Um, if the earlier classes, we all did this in class today, and then the later afternoon classes, I don't know what happens. But we didn't get to doing, this is number 50 on the study guide. Um, but Charles Darwin, James Daly, Reginald Dana, um, they all theorized that atolls are going to start as fringing reefs and then go to barrier and then finally go to an atoll. Um, coral, corals are going to colonize basaltic rocks. Basaltic rocks are the product of volcanic eruptions, um, particularly magma that is low in silicon dioxide. I literally just learned that today. Um, but that's basaltic and it's since it's flow relatively fast, not very slow, relatively fast. Anyhow, um, it's gonna make an emergent, it's gonna make an underwater volcano, and then it will eventually emerge out of the water. Um, and then that, you know, volcano is gonna stop volcanoing and stop erupting, and then it'll be dormant. And now your corals can start to colonize. It's 9:36. Darn it. Um, corals are gonna continue to grow on there and colonize, creating a fringing reef around the volcano. 
the island is going to start to kind of break down and erode at the top. Um, and it's going to start to sink. That's called subsidence, the sinking of the land. It's going to start to subside. As it sinks, it's going to erode um, like on the edges, and then a lagoon can start to form in and, and start to like fill in with water. In the meantime, your corals are still growing higher and higher and higher. Um, when the lagoon has grown enough, we can call it a barrier reef. And it become, you know, we have a, I don't know necessarily exactly what the stipulations are. There has to be a certain depth of the lagoon or a certain distance that the lagoon is a barrier between the corals and the actual land is associated with. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but when it's grown enough, the reef will continue to grow even though the island is sinking because the corals are growing vertically to stay towards the sunlight. Um, and then the island is going to sink entirely below the surface. It's going to leave around this entire ring of coral that was initially, like, you know, the barrier reef part. And you're going to have a lagoon in the middle. So this is misleading. Right here it says a shallow lagoon. But I think, like, in these pictures when we see this, we're like, wow, that's so deep. And maybe maybe it's me. Uh, but, I, and I really think it's because on, on the outsides we have a extremely shallow reef system and then in here you know it's it's obviously going to look much deeper because you know there's no there's no sediment there but all of this is this light blue light light green because it's that coral structure building 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 um yeah okay so it is the marshall islands the bikini at all so here's my Ar marshall island chain <coughs> here's hawaii over here are Marshall Islands. Okay, so it's really going to be formed like right here. If I'm looking at this first um, graph where you have your plate tectonic boundaries, Marshall Islands. Oh, no, I'm on the wrong side. No, I'm not. I'm on the right side of the world. Here we are. Marshall Islands are going to be forming right along here. And in this plate boundary, you have a subduction zone. You have a zone where a plate is going underneath another, and that friction right here, where my top hand is on top of my bottom hand, you know, when you have millions of tons of rock, that is going to create a lot of friction. It can create friction just doing this, right? It, enough friction that you melt rocks, you melt them, and, and gas explodes from them, and, and it's, it's something to marvel at. Volcanoes are insane. But that's your Marshall Island. And so, you know, as the, the plates on the top of the, the, the um, your continental plates are moving over the asthenosphere, over, you know, the top part of your mantle, the plates can move kind of like, you know, um, if you had like a, a, I don't know, like a plastic plate, like a plastic paper plate or not paper, but a plastic plate floating on top of water. Like it's kind of at the mercy of what the water is doing underneath it. Um, our tectonic plates also move they also move so they so these chains can be formed when we move away from a hot spot or like a little crack in the um the bottom of the ocean the oceanic crust what slide is this i can't see it We almost made it. Cool. All right, reef erosion. They're going really, really slow, really slow. So they only add like 5 to 25 millimeters of calcium carbonate a year, like tiny, tiny. Most coral reefs are between 5,000 and 10,000 years old. Reef erosion is detrimental. Um, it's any kind of wearing away of your calcium carbonate, like coral skeleton. It could be from physical things like storms and, and uh, the change in pH. It could also be from organisms eating at them and stepping on them. All right, and we can say that a reef is starting to erode when it is losing mass faster than it's gaining it. And it's only losing mass because the, the calcium um, carbonate is dissolving into the water. The carbonate ions in there are literally coming out of it, making them really weak. Okay. Bioerosion is going to be predation by um, biotic structures, things that are living. So this could be predators eating them. It could be humans stepping on them on accident. Um, physical erosion is going to be due to things that are non-living. So storms, ocean acidification, being exposed to air, currents, waves. 
boats, cute, thyl erosion, parrotfish, which are right here. They're so pretty. They're so pretty. A rainbow? Come on. They have a beak, and they will eat, like, the individual polyps of corals with their little beak. It's cute. Um, but they'll eat the entire coral polyp, and uh, they end up excreting out the calcium carbonate in their feces. Therefore, there's an overall loss in calcium carbonate. Um, it's not like, I don't think the corals can just take up calcium carbonate. I believe they have to create it. I don't think it's it's a molecule that they are able to reassimilate back to themselves. They're just going to need calcium, they're going to need carbon, and they're going to need oxygen to recreate it. Or carbon dioxide. No, not even that. And here you can see a result of bioerosion eating off the sides. This is just going to cause it to be pretty weak, you know. If we're, imagine a huge current comes over, you know, it's going to break that thing in half. Ooh, there's that dreaded crown of thorns starfish. So if you look close at this picture in the top right, I feel like you can see the difference in, like, tissue on top of the brain coral. Um, like on the top part here, it looks like it's definitely been picked over and eaten, but then right here, it looks a little bit thicker towards the bottom. Um, but they've been a serious threat in the Indo-Pacific for 50 years. Um, the females do produce up to 65 million eggs, but remember, that's not anything unusual for an invertebrate. They do it all the time. Um, your biggest problem is going to be the reduction in their predators due to, um, harvesting and, uh, runoff. Runoff that increases the phytoplankton population, which is going to increase the um, food for the crown of fish larvae so that they're able to live and metamorphose into adults. Physical erosion. Low tide can cause desiccation. Desiccation is called um, drying out, but in this class we'll call it desiccating, drying out. Um, many corals are going to try really hard not to grow in places where they're going to be exposed to any kind of tide change. That wouldn't be smart of them. And though they are made of like a calcium carbonate skeleton, they're not made of shells. So they can't close themselves off and like secure their moisture or anything like that. They'll just dry out. Um, storms, hurricanes, obviously all of those are going to increase. Oh, sorry. Increase the turbulence of the water, which is going to make it really, um, like, rough. And it could break off some of that coral. If they can't withstand the, the physical movement of the water and they can't withstand the, the energy, the wave energy and current energy, then they can end up just breaking. Um, corals can recover from hurricanes, though. It does depend on the amount of coral that's remaining because they do reproduce asexually. Was there a lot of sediment stirred up by turbulence? Um, is it still clouding the water? Has it settled down? And is it now filling the coral polyp's mouth and, and stopping it from feeding? Um, is algae growing there instead now and trying to take over? That's going to start to, you know, they're going to absorb the sunlight energy more than any zooxanthellae will. They can even grow on top of where the zooxanthellae were. And then um, was there a lot of runoff, right? What's your salinity like now? Was there a lot of, um, like, pollutants or um, excess fertilizers causing an algal bloom where you're going to block the top of the water column? <coughs> Ocean acidification. So, um, again, we need to really focus on that. Don't forget about the carbon cycle because it's here it is again. So, for the last 300 million years, the oceans have been slightly basic. And in the last 200 years since the Industrial Revolution, we figured out how to make an engine and how to burn um, fossil fuels. It's dropped to an 8.1. That seems small, but it's an exponential decrease um, because we measure pH on a logarithmic scale, like uh, 10 to the first, 10 to the second, 10 to the third, 10 to the fourth. So every time we go a drop in a pH, you are going really down like an exponential decline. It's not just like one point. It's nothing like that. It's, it's way worse. Um, hopefully in chemistry, you guys will learn how to calculate pH. I could totally show you, but I would need somebody to show me again for maybe like five minutes. 
Um, the definition of ocean acidification is just really making the ocean more acidic. So reducing its pH. If you reduce something, you're making it more acidic. This is caused by carbon dioxide going into our waterways. Creates carbonic acid. This acid can dissolve your calcium carbonate skeleton. Can also cause the zooxanthellae to peace out. We know that. Okay. Coral bleaching and climate change. The correlation between climate change and the rising carbon, di carbon dioxide in the atmosphere they have two effects on the ocean. One, it's going to be increasing the sea surface temperatures um, because uh, with the release of carbon dioxide, um, more water vapor in the air, and methane, although we really don't have methane in the oceans, but methane caused by um, just gross production of livestock is um, one of the most prevalent greenhouse gases and it holds on to that thermal energy from the sun really well. But all of those things, you know, if we're increasing the global atmospheric temperature, of course it's going to increase the ocean temperature. And it's going to cause a decrease in pH in the ocean. Temperature doesn't cause a decrease in the pH. Temperature doesn't touch pH, but it's that it's really just that carbon dioxide factor. Carbon dioxide along with water vapor and methane or greenhouse gases, which means that they hold on to the sun's heat very well, kind of like a blanket, which is why when it becomes nighttime here, um, it does not get nearly as cold as it would when it turns nighttime in like um, the desert, like in Arizona. It could drop 30 degrees at night because you have no water vapor holding on to, you know, the, the day's heat <laughs> to what the sun had to give that day. And then um, your pH is going to be because of the dissolving of your carbonate ions because you have carb carbonic acid inside of the ocean. Okay, and um, again, our zooxanthellae are super picky. So if they are not in the right temperature, right depth, right salinity, right pH, they're out of here and they will become expelled from the corals. Corals can take back in zooxanthellae if they find another one that they're like, hey, we'll give it a try, we'll see how you do. Um, Corals can also filter feed for themselves, but again, they just cannot grow at the rate that they do with those valley. Um, click these videos. I don't want to because it's not going to keep the video on it. You won't see it, and it'll definitely slow down my computer. But seeing corals, like, psh, get out their those valley, it's pretty cool. And definitely, you know, watch how dead the Great Barrier Reef is. Feel a little sad. This is sad. So same picture, but years apart. Okay, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. You guys, I have so many other things to do. You have no idea. Um, great. All right, the artificial reefs. Um, okay. Corals can, we, we talked about this in class today, corals can absorb like 97% of wave energy coming into shore. And so um, I know some of you were like, what does that mean? What does that mean? Um, what does it mean you absorb something's energy? So um, I can give you one example. Um, if I were going to like punch someone in the face, I would have a lot of energy like in my fists and my muscles, a lot of potential energy because I'm going to have stored ATP there because my body knows like, oh, she's clenching her muscles, like fight or flight reaction. And then I'm going to transfer that to kinetic energy, moving energy. And whoever is the lucky recipient of me striking them, and I wouldn't because I, I don't put my hands on people. I've never hit anybody. Scout's honor. Um, as, as, you know, your fist comes closer to somebody's face, what's going to absorb all that energy? Their face. And if their face cannot withstand that energy or that pressure, <clears throat> their face will break. So that works. That's how that works. So same thing with our corals. Um, our corals are going to absorb a lot of that wave energy. They're made for that. They're like skeletal structures. They're made for that. But if those waves are too strong, like a huge hurricane, or if the corals are being eroded and it's almost like, you know, people who have brittle bone disease, you, you know, you have a really healthy skeleton. Actually, no, I have holes inside of my skeleton. Thanks. I'm really weak. That's no good. Um, they're just going to be more susceptible to damage, um, and, and they will break. If they can't withstand that energy, something has to give. It's not the water that's going to break. It's going to be your coral. Um, cool. They can reduce the weight height by 84% just by absorbing some of that. 
which helps us in flooding. It's going to help with storm surge and storm damage. It's going to help erosions of your shoreline. Um, it's going to help any properties that are coastal. Um, it's going to help in ecosystems maintaining like their nursery ability. Like our lagoon and our, our Indian River is a nursery for so much because it's estuarine waters. It's warm, it's calm, it's near the ocean. Yeah, our river benefits if we have anything that's um, taking a lot of that wave energy away, which we do. We have the barrier islands, which is the, um, you know, Merritt Islands. It's a barrier. Barrier islands. The whole, actually the entire like coastline over the bridge is all barrier islands. Um, because they are the barrier in between the river and the ocean. Um, healthy corals can also protect boats and anchorages. Um, you have two different definitions for anchorages. One is going to be if you are on a boat, um, it's the portion of the harbor or the estuary where your boat is going to anchor to. Ha! And for an organism, an anchorage is going to be the location on the substrate where the or organism can attach to. So where the organism is anchoring itself at. Corals can reduce the turbulence in the area that make, so it makes it safer for boats because they're absorbing a lot of that wave energy and the boats aren't going to be toppling up and down. Um, economic disadvantages though, because they could, um, you know, put coastal properties at a lot of like financial damage or like physical damage and it'll cost you financially. Um, also, just like we talked about in bell work, um, <clears throat> we're going to lose money in tourism. We'll also lose revenue in harvesting. Um, because we're not going to have as many of those fish there because we have no corals for them to live by. So a lot of um, like warmer oceanic coral areas are creating artificial reefs. And we're reusing things and recycling things, but making them cleaner before we put them in. Taking off paint, taking off wiring, taking out of batteries, anything that's um, caustic, anything that is going to be... Um, you know, just over time a pollutant in, in the water. So um, artificial reefs are good because they're going to help biodiversity and um, they're going to help, like, sustain the, the ecological system. Um, I'm trying to think. I know one of the questions on your study guide, I don't have it in front of me, says, what is the disadvantage of artificial reef? Um, maybe it would be, like, having to pay, you know, have, costing money to actually pay somebody to put these down here, anchor them down, etc. Um, I think another one is that they're unsightly. Ugh, I don't want to see that. That's gross. I, I think that's one of them. I'll have to look back. That's People are silly. Um, but artificial reefs, they're going to help decrease wave energy and wave height. Um, you know, they're just going to kind of like absorb a lot of that water energy and and save the shoreline from having to absorb it all. Artificial reefs are put in places where they don't have a rocky substrate, so corals won't naturally apply themselves there. So they are becoming that rocky substrate. They're putting the rocky substrate there. Um, we can make them with non-toxic concretes, um, sacks filled with sand, stone blocks, sunken chips, a tanker, a reef ball. Here's our reef ball. The reef ball is heavy so that it stays in place. The reef ball also has holes in it that can serve as um, protection and hiding out for predators. In Cancun, um, there's an underwater museum. They have uh, more than 400 different human structures, and over time, we are going to build some phenomenal coral reefs on here. That's for sure. Because I don't think Cancun, like, it does not have, like, really volcanic bottoms. It's in the Gulf. I've been to Cancun. You ever heard of it? <laughs> cool brag. Um... No, I don't think they have a, a rocky, it's not a rocky bottom. So, I mean, you can put corals in that area, so maybe you don't have the right substrate. Fine, we can put the substrate there. As long as the pH, the temperature, the salinity, and the light amount is good, and they have a substrate to grow on, we can put the substrate there. Okay. Um, reconstructing the history of coral reefs. So, we can use this. It's helpful because it helps us figure out um, what was the temperature like at that time? What was the um, pH level at that time? Um, 
a lot of there's a lot of things we can we can date them back and see how old these different um, you know calcium structures are. So we can literally drill down into a coral reef to take out samples. And they'll give you kind of like a timeline. Um, so these uh, researchers looks like they drew on these different lines, so you can see where uh, time is changing. Um, but on this one here, you can see these faint lines here that will correspond to their growth because we, you know, can apply that they usually only grow, you know, a couple millimeters a year, really small. All right, um, the width how wide they can grow themselves will be dependent on what the temperature was like, what the nutrients were like, um, you know, did they have a lot, was there a limit, uh, were there other environmental conditions, what was the pH like, um, was there a lot of dissolved oxygen there at the time. So that's the benefit of using, you know, coral reef history, core data. Hey. Um, last slide. Sorry, just want to make sure I show my camera again. No. no. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Anyways, okay. <clears throat> last slide. So radiocarbon dating. Um, carbon on its own is just normal carbon, non-radioactive carbon is carbon-12, <clears throat> which means it has um, an atomic mass of 12 um, atomical units. It has six protons and six electrons, and in order to make it weigh 12, it must also have six neutrons. And so an isotope is, um, this is a radioactive isotope specifically because it is has radioactive decay, um, a isotope is an element, um, it has the same number of protons, but it has a different atomic mass, therefore it must have a different number of neutrons. So carbon-14 is, um, it must, it's going to weigh 14 atomical units. Carbon, again, carries six protons, so how many more neutrons must it have now? Um, it needs to have a total of eight or two more. Okay, um, so how does carbon-14 get created, and um, how can we use carbon-14 to figure out, you know, the, um, the age of, of corals? So the, in this step number one, I mean, this, this isn't my forte, so I'm not totally sure how this happens. You might have to ask Baker or something. But when ultraviolet light will react with nitrogen, um, you know, that energy can cause it to react. It, and we have a ton of nitrogen in the atmosphere, it can create carbon-14. Normally, carbon is carbon-12, but when ultraviolet light reacts with nitrogen, carbon-14 gets created. Now, we also have plenty of oxygen in the atmosphere as well. Carbon-14, or you know, carbon, is going to join with oxygen gas, and they're going to produce carbon dioxide, CO2, except this is a radioactive form of carbon dioxide. And just like we did with um, you know, chapter four, <clears throat> carbon dioxide is going to diffuse into the oceans, um, can also um, become dissolve out. They typically try and keep themselves at equilibrium. Um, producers are going to take in this carbon dioxide to do photosynthesis and create organic material like glucose. In, in this case, the producer we're going to be talking about is zooxanthellae um, because we're trying to age the corals. So ultraviolet light reacts to nitrogen in the atmosphere, and it creates C14. Carbon-14 will join with oxygen gas, and it's going to create carbon dioxide, and that can diffuse into the oceans. Producers are going to take this up, do photosynthesis. After they photosynthesize, the zooxanthellae are going, you know, now they have this glucose molecule, and the carbon in the C6H12O6, the carbon is a radioactive form of it. And it's our coral host, the coral itself, that is also going to be using this organic material. Because, uh, again, the the zooxanthellae can create organic material for the coral. Now, um, the coral needs to make calcium carbonate. So we do have calcium in the ocean. But the carbonate, carbon and oxygen, where is that carbon going to come from? That carbon's coming from the radioactive version that was taken up by your producers. Now, once deposited, the radioactive decay can start to begin. Once the corals use that um, carbon dioxide to create calcium carbonate, 
it will start to decay radioactively. And uh, it's going to be decreasing the actual amount of carbon-14 in the sample of the corals. Now, we'll never run out. We can never go to zero. So um, it's half-life, which means it's going to start off as soon as we're at, you know, between step five and six, the corals use this carbon to make calcium carbonate, and then they deposit it. They, like, they excrete it, and they solidify themselves to the substrate that they're on. Now this half-life, like, ticking time bomb starts. So once they're deposited, they have 100% of, um, uh, what do you call it? They have 100% of the C14. Carbon-14 is a half-life of 5,730 years. So that means every 5,730 years, carbon-14 loses half of its um, mass, half of its, like, amount in that coral structure. So we start off with 100, and then after 5,730 years, it's lost half its life. It's a half-life. So now it's down to 50%. Another 5,730 years go by, and now that 50% is now down to half, and it's 25%. Another 5,730 years go by, that 25% is now broken half, and it's now 12.5%. 5,730 years go by. And now you have 6.25%. Uh, another 5,170 years ago, 730 years go by. And now you have three, um, hold on, what was it? 12.525. We'll have 3.12.5. So, or I'm sorry, 3.125. Anyways, you know, we can keep cutting that in half and in half and in half and in half and a half, and you're never going to run out. You're never just going to go to zero. And that's what this graph is showing. I'll just do the first example with you. So we started 100%, and after 5,000 years, the they're showing increments here of 2,000 years. Here's 10,000, 20,000. So 2,000, 4,000, 6,000, 8,000, 10,000. At 50%, it should be 5,730 years. And if I read this down... It is not on the 6,000 line. It's right before that. So that's correct. At the 25%, we should have two half-lives go by, which will put it somewhere like 11,460. Um, so here's 25, and it's, yeah, it's, nope, I'm sorry. 25, I can read. Um, so here's 10,000. This is 1,200, 1,400. And so at 25, um, I should have about, again, like almost almost 12,000, but 11,400, I think, and 60, I think. All right, guys, this is Chapter 5 Notes.